All right, good morning. Sorry again uh, that I was running a little late. Um, and uh, let me get rid of this. I've got the undersized, I do not comply here with my power supply. So um, I'm gonna go pretty quick, so since I was a little late, uh, I'm gonna spend time talking about why it, it matters how you're, you're developing uh, for IoT. Um, open source, obviously very important period, um, extremely important in this space. Um, this is gonna be a little bit of a different story, I think, than you know, you've normally heard. But you know, I, I talk about the holy grail of digital. Um, you know, I'll get to that, but a lot of people are just hacking stuff together in this market and kind of missing the point on what the real potential is. Actually, I would argue that most people are doing it wrong. And so I'll kind of walk through why. Um, I'm gonna go through quick. If you have any interest in this story or, or uh, about cats, you know why here in a second. Um, uh, <laughs> follow me on Twitter, but there's a whole blog series, like one of the last posts comes out today, so you'll get a lot more if you go there, but I'll go quick, but, and we'll talk about EdgeX and some other uh, open source projects that we're working on, so you know, as we go. First buzzword of the day, okay? Digital transformation. This matters, and, and I'll talk more why, so I know uh, you guys are all kind of a developer crowd. How many sort of a developer uh, uh, versus end user? Developers? Yes? Typically you'll find those you know, in open source. And I'm with end users? Anyone? You know, okay, yeah, developer, yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, you know, a lot of, lot of really great talks, you know, here, but I, I'm gonna spend a little time on, on sort of the business side, the why. You should always ask why, because you, if you're gonna develop something, it's gotta be useful and it's gotta go places. This really matters. The pace of innovation is what matters, you know, these days. Um, it's all about outcomes. It used to be, you know, kind of the widget and whatnot. Now it's about uh, the outcome. I mean, you look at, you know, Power by the Hour was coined in the early 80s. There's things like managed print services that Xerox did a while back. Nest was like the first IoT success story, um, you know, out there. They, they kind of did the outcome of, you know, improve comfort while saving power. But guess what? Nest didn't follow the first rule. They, they didn't stay innovative. You know, when Google bought them, they kind of fell behind the wayside, and then all of a sudden a lot of different thermostats came along and, and they fell kind of back a little bit. There's just many examples you know, out there now where, where whenever you're developing something, it's about kind of that, that outcome in the end. It's also about a new mindset. So it used to be when I develop a product, you know, I put it out there and, and that's the experience. And, and if you want a new experience, we'll buy a new product. Okay, um, you know, this is like old stereo system. That was your experience when you bought a stereo for until you buy a new stereo you know, many years ago. Now, of course, everything's software defined. And this is, you guys know this. Um, Sonos is a great example of a company that kind of follows this, this ecosystem model. And, and so, uh, you know, but even they, they are getting challenged by, uh, you know, other types of products, like I mentioned with Nest. But if you look at the new mindset, there's, there's kind of a couple key things here. It's number one, when you develop any kind of software code, product, service, whatever, it is about the cumulative value of that product or service over the lifespan of that product not when you ship it. That's, that's like kind of rule number one these days. You know, all the stuff that you see, kind of software defined everything, you know, over the air updates and whatnot. Number two, it's like be in an ecosystem, either you join one or you make one, but if you're not in one, you will die, period. So this is the way, the way it is going forward, and we'll talk more about that. And finally, it's about changing, you know, capital expense into OPEX and, you know, making, you know, like services like your phones have and whatnot. So, this is how you kind of create that necessary stickness and the network effect related to that and ecosystem is extremely, extremely important. So always we, when you're developing stuff, kind of think about that sort of network effect and ecosystem effect. I love this story. There's a lot of stuff about this online, but maybe one of these companies doesn't look quite like the others. You know, I don't know. I mean, it was, uh, Domino's was named the most innovative company of 2017, one of the list, and it's a pizza company and it's because of digital. I mean, there's, there's so many different ways to order pizza online. You know, you can tweet a pizza emoji and, uh, and get a pizza. You can, there's all kinds of stuff. They realize the power of their data. So, so uh, I mean, they're doing autonomous vehicles in, in Detroit with Ford to deliver pizza with a, a, an oven built in or baked in is a bad pun, I guess. Um, it's, 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 it's crazy. First off, it makes me annoyed that I didn't invest in these stocks, uh, any of these stocks back then. But if you think digital transformation is a buzzword is hooey, it's a pizza company. Okay, so you guys know about cloud native. You guys know about the value of continuous delivery, all this stuff. I don't need to tell, 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 tell this crowd, I think, about, about, about the value of loosely coupled microservices, nor do I need to say this. Now, the big thing I will say, so cloud native architecture 
it is not about where it's run, it's more about the principles of loosely a couple of microservices, platform independence and all that. I can update any single function without taking down the whole system. Um, so, so, so important, so come back to that, you know, where it's run, you might have gauged by the title. Ring a bell? Maybe you guys are not old enough, I don't know. <laughs> AOL came along at a time when a lot of people thought that the internet was like just this magical thing. I, I didn't know it had been around for a long time in, in you know, government universities and whatnot. You get these little CDs in the mail and you get on. They dumbed it down to make it easy to get on and start forming an ecosystem. Now that was you know, kind of what they did. And then all of a sudden people started hearing about this weird word Google. And like you can go to this page and it's just like a logo and you type in and magical things come back. And, and people literally sort of realizing I, cannot, I can actually connect to the internet without going through AOL. Oh, wow. So then all these websites come up and these tiny little trends of like uh, e-commerce and social and mobile all kind of went on, your little stuff. The thing about IoT, AI say we're in this, the AOL stage of IoT kind of early on. But the thing is that a lot of people are like, oh, it's cheap sensors and ubiquitous connectivity and the rise of the cloud. Okay, sure, right, okay. It is as much about the maker movement as anything. In, in all the industries you know, out there that are deploying IoT, whether you're doing consumer, industrial, whatever, it used to be that as soon as some small company that's innovative threatens your way of life, your proprietary lock people in, fat service contract way of life, you would buy them and you'd kill them. That's how you maintain status quo. With the maker movement, there is not, and all, you know, developers like yourselves that are like innovating and coding and all that, and I mean hardware software too, or hardware like, there is not enough money in the world to buy up all the ankle biters, so either you change or you die. This is the classic innovator's dilemma. That if I just do more of what I've always done, I will succeed. This goes back to that pace of innovation. It's extremely important. But I still, I mean, we're getting more traction in IoT, it's early, but I like to say it's AOL stage um, you know, for, for, for a, a number of reasons. But how many of you guys work on consumer uh, stuff versus enterprise consumer? A little bit, okay, enterprise, industrial. Okay, so, so, okay, so you guys, this is the preeminent conference diagram for IoT. You cannot go to an IoT conference without like an OT-IT Venn diagram. You, I think you have to have it laminated on your badge. But it's important. So OT folks, operations folks, people that live in the physical world, do processes. This is mission critical stuff. They care about uptime and reliability and safety and quality and all that. And IT, of course, cares about um, you know, security, you know, uh, privacy, governance, scale, uh, massive scale all over the place. Um, the OT people historically, I mean, they've been running processes in the physical world for a long time. I mean, IoT is basically about this type of stuff uh, hitting scale. Um, yes, partly because it's more accessible, partly because of the maker movement. Um, so embedded computing hitting scale is IoT. Of course, I'm adding more sensor-driven analytics. Um, usually it starts with kind of monitoring, and then I add some analytics, and then I automate and maybe do more true AI. But you know, always start with monitoring. The OT folks historically have been like, don't even touch it if, if, if the process is running. Like literally, you could drag me away from like, my process with my fingernails in the concrete from Windows 95, you know, if it's running. Um, security by obscurity, like you don't connect to broader networks because that int introduces threats. In, in OT, if you have a security breach, immediate loss of life or limb or, or production. I mean, $20,000 a minute it could be. In IT world, a, a breach, and you will be breached, it's a matter of when and how you handle it. In the IT world, a breach plays out over long periods of time, it has a very long tail. This is like credit card fraud, you know, years and years of impact. This is because of the scale. It's important that these groups work together. Uh, I like to say IoT starts in OT and scales in IT, but this is a very important dynamic. And then, then there's the LOB, the line of business, and they actually ultimately make a lot of the decisions here. But if, if you, you, you guys probably don't, um, you know, as a developer, you might not kind of see some of the business side here. I, I don't know, but when you develop product, though, code, you need to pay attention to the way that you update stuff so that you, because you can't just push an update in the middle of a process. I and mean, imagine an OT person seeing a pop-up that says, hey, sorry, uh, your manufacturing line will reboot in 15 minutes, save your work. You can't do that, you know, so very different. So it's just stuff to consider. Got a lot of sayings you're gonna pick up on. Um, a lot of the market, even though we're getting traction, and because of this dynamic, we're seeing uh, what I call pie in the sky uh, mode. Take a Raspberry Pi class device and I hook it, I innovate, I hook it up to some public cloud and I just get going. 
A lot of it, the time it's the OT person on the shop floor. They know their processes. They have the domain knowledge. They're doing shadow IT, completely bypassing IT, and they just get going and, and you know, innovating. Um, but they don't really think about what they're kind of getting, getting into. And so before they know it, once you really get going, also call it pie in the sky mode because they're usually no business case. It's just tinkering, you know, pie in the sky ideas. But once they really get going, they start realizing the cost of pumping data mindlessly to some cloud and then having to pay to get your own data back, ouch. You know, and then you have to re-architect. So it's important as a developer to think about for end users how you're developing software. And this is why we're going to be talking about how cloud native you know, needs to be more places, and, and I'll explain why. Um, you guys have heard about edge computing. It's like you know, the three, four years ago when I started working on this at Dell Technologies, it was like, everyone, I say everyone had their head in the cloud, and everyone talks about edge. The cloud's not going away. It, the deepest of deep learning will always happen there, but you're going to see more and more stuff at the edge. Um, and so, so it, it, a lot of people say it's because of uh, a variety of reasons. I mean, billions of 50 billion devices, I don't really care. It's just so many devices on networks, you can't possibly send everything uh, to the cloud. And so. I like to use cat videos to explain why. So now you, you might understand you know, why my shirt. Um, so my wife and I have three cats. Um, it's no shame in this game. Uh, we got larger capacity storage on our phone so that we can send cat videos back and forth. Uh, if you follow my Twitter, you'll see occasional cat fly by. Um, but cat videos I use to explain the need for edge computing. So if I post one of my videos online and it, it starts to kind of get hits, well, I have to cache it on more servers You're back in the, you're way back in the cloud. If it goes viral, then I have to move that content as close to the, the, the subscribers that I can get it to. Um, as a telco, the closest I can cast stuff, or Netflix or whatever, is at the bottom of the, it's at the cloud edge, the bottom of my cell tower is the, you know, these uh, points on the key, key points on the internet. This, this is the concept of MEC, multi-access edge computing, so bringing content closer to subscribers. Well, now if I have like billions of connected cat callers out there, I've completely flipped the paradigm and I've got, instead of things trying to pull down, I got all these devices trying to push up. That makes you have to push the, the compute even further down. So, um, you know, very, very important to kind of be thinking about these tiered models uh, as we go. So, yes, everyone says, okay, you need edge computing because of latency. I don't care how fast your airbag is, you do not deploy your airbag from the cloud. 5G, people are like literally saying, oh, you're going to drive your car from the cloud, you're an idiot. You're not going to drive, I don't care how fast your network is, you do not do that kind of stuff over wide area, you, you do local control. Um, uh, bandwidth, it costs a lot of money to move data. You know, so you need to kind of consider what type of meaningful data you're sending back. Security, a lot of people talk about security and IoT, it's important, but, but if you have smarts closer to things, plus all that legacy stuff that was never connected, intended to be connected to the internet, you need smarts there for, for identity access management, root of trust, threat detection, all that kind of stuff. The big breach that happened a couple years ago or a year and a half ago when all those cameras took down the net, I mean, first off, the problem was the developers made it very easy to not change passwords. It's like password, password, you know, okay, instant gratification, I want to connect up my camera. Had you had some smart, oh, then the bots you know, took over and you know, took down the net DDoS attack. Had you had some smarts there, it would have been, wait, I mean, this traffic is a little weird, shut it down at the source. You need intelligence. But the kicker is the total life cycle cost of data. When you start mindlessly pumping data to the cloud and you're, when you're in pie in the sky mode, you're gonna quickly realize if you start doing analytics on that data, you are going to really pay for it in terms of the cost. So, so a lot of people out there aren't, aren't talking about that life cycle cost. They're talking about latency, security, and bandwidth, which is you know, definitely part of it. Okay, but there's many edges. There's not a single edge. Edges, you know, lingo, bingo, whatever. Like, you know, uh, to a telco, the bottom of the cell tower is the closest that I can move, you know, compute, as I said, for my cat videos. Uh, you might have noticed it used to be, uh, MEC used to be, um, mobile edge computing, now it's multi-axis edge computing. They changed the name with the same acronym because now it's not just mobile devices, it's things too. Um, uh, you can have micromodular data centers, you can have hyper-converged infrastructure, you know, kind of gateway type nodes like on a factory floor, and then to an OT person, the edge is the physical world, device, the device edge as we call it. There's many edges, there's never gonna be in one single one. You wanna be able to run across this regardless of whether you're OT, IT. Um, the way I describe edge computing, it is moving compute as both uh, necessary and feasible to the subscribers that need it. So if I'm a mobile user, the closest and feasible a telco can move it is the bottom of the, the, the towers, you know, the, the, my baseband units. 
If I'm an OT person, the most uh, necessary place to move edge compute is on-prem, like on the same LAN as the stuff that's needing it. So this is how I describe it. Got to be thinking about how you dynamically, when you develop software, how you dynamically move workloads, microservices across this spectrum while balancing the needs between OT and IT. It is crazy town out there in terms of fragmentation. If, you know, are you guys actively developing Fry OT right now? Show of hands. Yes? Yep. Good. Okay. Cool. So, um, so if you've done it, and especially if you've done it in industrial, you'll know that there are thousands of protocols out there. Remember how I mentioned people would you know, kill off companies to kind of maintain their stale business models? People would create proprietary protocols to lock you in, so your switching costs are really high. Uh, so many, many protocols, of course, in the IT world, there's tens that matter. In the OT world, there's, there's literally a thousand plus protocols, and we count proprietary ones. We'll never have one standard. The old standards joke is we'll fix the standards problem with one more standard. No, nope, you need to bring them together. Uh, domain expertise, it takes a village. You cannot tell developers that you must only program in Java. You know, it doesn't work. You need polyglot if you want to build an ecosystem. And then in, in embedded, the closer you get to the edge, the more and more fragmented choices get. It's, you know, not only hardware, more and more custom, the closer you get to the physical world, but also software. Um, you know, software gets more and more complex. Now, the software gets a little, the curve of the complexity of software increasing the closer you get to the device edge is a little flatter, and then it goes up steeply when you hit controllers. Uh, if hardware starts going up, and then, it, and then it, and eventually you're at parity. So, so software, you can software to find things more readily closer and closer to the edge while also recognizing you still need embedded, you know, hard, hard real-time control systems. But the closer you can get your know, flexibility to the physical world, the better. Crazy Town platform world, running joke was 150 three years ago, now it's 450 platforms. Not all the same, it's just not sustainable. There's a lot of reinvention happening around now, right now. I talk with a lot of companies out there. I would, the last thing I would do right now is start up a generic IoT platform. I would focus on value, and we'll kind of get into that a bit, 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 bit more. How do I get to advanced class? That's just like getting out of AOL stage. To get to advanced class, I need to do a, a, a handle, I need to intelligently handle streaming data, so make decisions in memory in the moment. Is that useful, is that useful? Nope, 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 scrap it, scrap it, scrap it. Send that back, analyze this on the spot and act. This intelligence and streaming data at the edge is important. Otherwise, you end up with like pumping all this data to the back, uh, back end. It's like a bad episode of that TV show, Hoarders, just stockpiling data that you'll never actually touch. Scale, once you have some success, that pace of innovation, it breeds more interest for more data, and then now I've got a scale problem. I've got a lot of people that we work with that are like doing pie in the sky. C command line interface is cool, P managing party of one. Go try to manage a billion managed objects in a connected car scenario. Because you know, every car's got about 100 ECUs, and then you multiply it out by a fleet. Try to do that. This is why you know, management really matters, but a lot of people don't think about that up front because you know, they're just kind of doing basic stu uh, stuff and getting started. And then, of course, um, security matters, and we'll talk a little bit about that here in a bit. The true potential, though, is a system of systems. How do I get to this true potential of IoT? Instead of a bunch of intranets, everything interconnected you know, uh, across an ecosystem, this is the real power of stuff, energy, you know, manufacturing, farming, all that. Well, put some blockchain on it, right? You know, just put some, I mean, that's good. Have you ever seen the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Yeah, the dad sprays blockchain on every, or, or Windex on everything. I call blockchain one of the Windexes of technology. Uh, 5G is also one. Um, a little bit of AI. There's a lot of people saying, oh, I do AI, and they're actually doing a, if this, then that rolls in. Just like, no, you're not. Anyway, so blockchain, very, very important. It'll change society as we know it. Way, way overhyped. There's a lot of challenges. Read the blog for it. I can't get into all the, the detail, but I like to talk about technology in a practical way. It will matter, and I'll come back to this. It matters in many ways, but also you know, be careful with the hype. Um, you have to start separating the application plane you know, on top, the insights, the, the domain knowledge from the infrastructure. Way too many IoT platforms are reinventing the same ingredients over and over and over again for security and management tied in with the underlying uh, or with the overarching applications. When's the last time your ERP system managed PCs? You don't do that. It just doesn't make sense. And so you want to have platform independent data ingestion, security, and management that feeds into your choice of applications. Most people are doing it completely backwards, but there's more. OK, so I want to extend the cloud native principles to the edge. So now I can update individual functions without taking down the whole system. This matters to an OT person. Now, continuous software delivery freaks out the typical operations person. You know, they're like, I don't, don't even touch it. But as the, in, the innovation happens around you, you're going to have to be ready to start innovating yourself, or you will die. So architect today for flexibility, even if you're just going to hard code to one cloud you know, now, if that's the right thing to do. So be, 
Developing software today, you've got to be thinking about where it goes. Open source matters. Open source is a period, a good way to, to minimize undifferentiated heavy lifting. You guys know this, you, you're passionate about this community and, and whatnot. It's also a great way to build ecosystems because you have tangible code that you can develop you know, ecosystems around. So um, lots of good stuff out there. There's just a mix of standards and this is not even all of them but, and some open source projects. I'm gonna talk about EdgeX. There's, there's, uh, I think there were some things. Have you guys heard about EdgeX? Did you see any of the sessions? Uh, definitely take a look at this project. So this is something that we've been working on with a bunch of great companies uh, because it's basically extending cloud native principles to the edge to create an open ecosystem. Think of EdgeX doing for IoT what Android did for mobile is the easiest way to put it even though it's not an OS. So it's, it's a loosely coupled microservices architecture. It's, governed, it's a Linux Foundation project just like Cloud Foundry. You can't plop Cloud Foundry down on a Raspberry Pi. It's a little heavy for that. Kubernetes, we're working on extending it down and whatnot in the community. But, Think of it as like you take your pick of protocols because uh, you'll never have one standard protocol. Uh, use this common SDK, pass through these APIs for a brief moment in time and then be as custom as you want on the other end too. So it's architected to bring together commercial value add around just enough of an API layer that bridges together this stuff. So, so it's an OS agnostic, hardware agnostic, protocol agnostic. It's built for cloud native edge. We believe it's really the only way that we're gonna to get to a true ecosystem to scale this out. Um, and then, you know, of course, be as com commercially proprietary as you want. Uh, this was a, a post-it note during our early session when we were uh, collaborating on it. It says, uh, provide a platform that will cure the paralysis of companies not deploying IoT, something like that, with a fear of making the wrong choice. That's what's happening out there. A lot of customers are like, uh, I don't know what to pick. I don't wanna get locked into one cloud. Uh, so I don't wanna take a leap of faith off a cliff. So I'm gonna do nothing. This is not good. So more on why we helped get this started. I'm not gonna get into all the technical details. There's a lot of great information online. There's people around. Uh, there's actually the, the TSC, the technical steering meetings that are completely open, it's open source, are running this week. So if you wanna stop by, you gotta just register, uh, go stop by. But imagine this whole thing running on something like a gateway, it could run on anything. The purple bar is that API uh, layer around these core services. It's, if you've ever seen uh, Big Lebowski, I, I call it the dude, it's like the rug that ties the room together. You can be as proprietary as you want out around it. In fact, you could replace every bit of code with proprietary code and still be EdgeX compliant. That's why it's the X. It's gonna be a certification program that you followed the baseline APIs. Anyway, so more on that later. It's built to be distributed. You can run it on all, all across uh, distributed architectures. Lots of people coming on board. There are a lot of uh, larger names coming in now. We, you know, a lot of the startups that we've been working with for a while joined early on for aforementioned reasons. The big names are like, ah, oh, I got this all figured out. I'm gonna own everything, I'm gonna lock people in. Well now they're realizing, man, this is hard. There's a lot of mess here. We need to band together on the commonality. We're following and meeting our commitment. So, so the Delhi release uh, comes uh, out in a couple uh, weeks. You're gonna see, I mean, the code was initially, we prototyped it when we had contributed it initially from Dell. It was like two and a half gigs of memory footprint because it was more about the architecture and cat herding, <laughs> cat herding um, less about the code up front. Now it's gone from two and a half gigs and kind of a Java base, we've redone it as a community in Go and it's 128 megs and half of that is the reference database. So it's compressed quite a bit. It's really starting to take off, a lot of stuff coming, so certification program coming, more and more security management as we go. Imagine a world where every microservice out there at the edge could advertise how you manage it in a common way, a de facto standard way. Start me, stop me, reset me, here's my quality of service needs. Really cool stuff that can happen when you, when you have this kind of capability. You can granularly manage every function in a common way even though they're proprietary individually. Uh, good for distributed deployments. There's even proprietary versions coming that are compressing the, the entire code base into, this is from, from, yeah, from commercial vendors, into um, a C binary, but I still use the APIs around the wheel and I get value from you know, cloud connectors that are plugged in or sensor connectors that are plugged in the bottom, those APIs. It grows an ecosystem, but also allows room for proprietary differentiation. We're also working with Acrano, a new project which is telco focused. Uh, uh, Acrano is another Linux Foundation project. EdgeX makes no decisions on the interoperability uh, uh, or like the, the infrastructure layer, because if you do, you're gonna be wrong to somebody, so we're completely protocol agnostic, OS agnostic, we're agnostic to Kubernetes, Docker, Mesos, whatever. Infrastructure in Acrano is being kind of selected, so these projects actually go really well together. So imagine where APIs developed by Acrano in that community are, are coordinated very tightly with APIs in EdgeX that's in the application plane, I could literally uh, even though I would like to prioritize the cats, uh, a healthcare app would get more priority over an, uh, 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 the cat app. 
uh, in a de facto standard way, even though you're building commercial software around it. Very, very cool stuff can happen. Okay, so the new world, this is about floating boats for scale, collaborating, and then make sure your boat is really good and really fast. This is how it works, period. I mean, no more lock-in stuff. This is about pace of innovation, as I said up front. Three rules for IoT scale. You gotta decouple the infrastructure from the insight plane. You cannot have, over and over again, different vertically focused platforms you know, with, the same, you know, with the different uh, security management features, because you'll end up with wildly different things for like, multiple different use cases in the, same, in the same organization. It will never scale, it's bad news. You want to decouple the edge from the cloud as close to the physical world as possible. The moment data is created, all data is created in the physical world. You want to decouple it, so now, you know, and EdgeX is a great way to do this in a cloud-native fashion, right above the controllers and, and all that, the, the hard real-time stuff. Because now you can control your data destiny. If you decouple it, you, know, it, it, uh, you can send it anywhere, on-prem, in-cloud, multi-cloud, multi-tenant, whatever. It's going to be multi-edge, multi-cloud world. The clouds are trying to produce what I call IoT gateway drugs, literally giving you some dev kit and make it all too easy to get locked into their cloud because they want to get your data and then charge you to get it back. So the clouds are doing great things, I'm not picking on them too much, but at the same time, as a developer, think about how for your end users, you're giving them that flexibility because we've only scratching the surface, but wait, there's more. Oh, the last thing, domain knowledge. You need to have the domain knowledge about industries, you know, manufacturing, energy, transportation, retail, healthcare, whatever, it's separate from the technology, and then you can pick the best technologies with the right domain knowledge. Right now, the vertically focused platforms are the ones that are actually doing something, but then you have like 10 platforms for 10 use cases, that's bad. Separate it out, that's kind of a catch-all rule. But wait, you know, to get to the real grail, and I'll tell you what that is, I need trust everywhere. And I've got a couple more minutes, so I'm gonna run through this quick, but again, you know, read the blogs and, and whatnot, but I wanna cross over between public and private domains, web and mobile, brick and mortar, you know, retail, uh, auto, home, industrial. This is the true potential. I cannot have any single entity own the trust. In consumer, you build trust with particular brands and sometimes the trust is violated, but in the, in the business world or B2B to C, home health, retail, usage-based insurance, you cannot have one company like an Amazon own the trust. It does not work. To get there, you need technology's help. You need silicon-based root of trust down at the silicon layer where data is created. You need trusted zero-touch provisioning. So we're working with a bunch of big companies, little small, uh, smaller companies that, that are doing all kinds of cool things. Um, Intel and ARM just announced last week that they're collaborating to help with a trusted provisioning across the supply chain, you know, ARM and, and, and you know, X, or x86 and, and ARM devices. Uh, open APIs, Ecrano, EdgeX, things, you know, open source projects that create that sort of transparency. Yes, you need Ledger, you know, blockchain stuff. And a little AI for context awareness, and I can get to the grail. And I've had hundreds of conversations with very smart people and nobody has said, well, that doesn't make sense that this is the grail. I want to sell data, resources, and services to total strangers. I want to create data in the physical world, set some terms on it, put it off into the ether, and collect checks from complete strangers. I mean, you, it, there's people doing this. Resources is like networking, storage, compute, energy, cars, any kind of consumable thing. Now, service, my domain knowledge, you've never met me before, but you, it's like Angie's List on steroids. That's like pure ledger. The other stuff, you need these open technologies. You have to collaborate on open plumbing or you will never have the trust and transparency. You guys are probably too young for this, this reference. Or overall, um, have you ever seen the movie Mr. Mom? It's a great 80s movie, go watch it. Uh, there's a clip in the, the deck, I don't know if this deck will be published, uh, whatever, but this lady comes out, he's trying to drop his kids off for the first time, and she's like, hi, hi Jack, I'm Annette, you're doing it wrong. Most of the clouds are, 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 are doing it wrong. A lot of people are thinking about the problem uh, re, uh, wrong. Um, in the movie, there's a, a, a scene in there that's um, basically some guy is like trying to, or you talk with him and put him down, and he's trying to, uh, Michael Keaton's trying to impress the guy, and, and the guy asks him about his, he's rewiring the house, what are you gonna do? You can put in 220, he's like, yeah, 220, 221, whatever it takes. It's a classic line, there's a lot of people that quote on the Google that are like, I guess my age. I literally check into my room last night, my blog on this, this topic post in this morning, I was in room 221, and look at the end of the hallway, 220, 221, whatever, I kid you not. So, so I know I went quick, you know, read, read my blogs if you want to kind of get the full story. It's a lot of funny moments. I got my little sayings or whatever. Maybe it, it makes you like cringe, but either way. If you're interested, stop by the EdgeX technical steering meetings. They're literally co-located here. Type EdgeX TSC Edinburgh and you'll find it. Just register maze in the back with some questions from Linux Foundation. It's not just about EdgeX. We think it's very important. Um, just 
collaborate and let's go figure this out. Holy grail, three to five years out. But right now, it's like get people started when they're in pie in the sky mode without getting locked in. You need to keep your options open. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs>